So moving along, let's talk a little bit about dimensions and space. Now there's the, the obvious dimension here is the width between the box you need to get correct. Um, just from an estimation purpose, every one HP or horizontal pitch is equal to a fifth or 0.2 of an inch. So in other words, five HP is equal to one inch. And if you just want to estimate, you can. I mean, but but this this dimension here is really going to be set by your rails. The dimension that you want to consider, and one of the the key design factors of your case, is is how deep it's going to be. And likewise, if you're going to build a lid, how deep the lid is going to be. I don't remember what I did on mine. Let's take a measurement here real quick. Okay, so from from the top of the rail down to the very bottom of the case, mine is four and a half inches. Now I would say that's probably more than you need. Um, you can probably get away dropping an inch off of that if you really wanted to. There's a couple things to keep in mind though, and that is the, the power and whatever is gonna reduce the amount of depth that you have. So in this case, you can see I'm using some IntelliGel power supplies. Uh, I'll talk more about mounting later, but I'm not sure if you can tell in the video, they're, they're raised about a quarter of an inch off of the base of the case. And then they themselves have space that comes up for the header and then space that comes up for this part right here. So when you design your depth, what you want to think about is what is the highest point that something comes up off of the base and how much space from the top of my rails to the highest point do I want to be. Now in my case, that dimension actually comes out to a little over three and a half inches. So even though the depth of my case, the total depth from top of rail to bottom of case is four and a half inches, the minimum amount that I have is 3.6 or a little over three and a half. Now, how much you want to add here is really up to you. I think at a minimum, you probably want to keep it around two and a half. Uh, I don't remember what the skiff standard is off the top of my head. A nice thing though that I have learned about having a deep case, this is the deepest case that I have owned and worked with, is when it gets this deep, it's much easier when you've got a bunch of modules in here and you wanna get something plugged in. I have learned that if I have a hole about 14 HP wide, I can get my whole hand down in here and I can easily reach under. There's just, there's just a lot more room to work. So even though I probably could have shaved maybe an inch, inch and a half off of the depth of this case, and maybe that would drop my weight a little bit, I feel like I just enjoy working in this deep case a little bit more. And I never have to really worry about if a module is going to be too deep because I have plenty, plenty of room here. Okay, so next up, let's talk about power. Wow, there's a lot to talk about with power and I am no electrical engineer. Um, but I do know a couple of things and I can walk you through that. First off, I want to give a big shout out to this book. I, I really like this book, by the way. This book just has tons and tons and tons of great information in a patch and tweak um, by Bajuk or whatever the name of their publishing company is. Um, they have an entire chapter on power, which is sort of what got me started, um, and that gave me the confidence to go and to read manuals and specifications from manufacturers and have some sense of knowing what I was talking about. Um, but anyways, I, I definitely recommend if you have this book, check it out. And if you don't, well, it's a great resource anyways. You should get it. So when it comes to power, there are a lot of things to consider. The first is how much power you have and if that's adequate for the modules that you want to run in your case. The second is how many power headers you have, and if you have the right quantity for the number of modules you have. The third is how power gets into your system, the power entry aspect. And the fourth is the kind of power supply that you're using. So let's sort of start off with uh, that first one, which is I think the most important, the quantity of power. The Really the main thing here that you wanna know is do you have enough power in your case to power what you wanna be plugging into it? The easiest way to figure this out or to get a rough estimate is to go onto modulargrid.net to create a case sort of like what you're thinking of building to add the modules like what you would want to be adding and then to look at what the power requirements are. There's a couple of places in modular grid that will show you this information. Of course, immediately at the bottom, it'll tell you what your expected plus 12, minus 12, and plus 5 volt expectations of uh, required amps are. 
that that's probably the main thing that you need to know. Modular Grid will show you a couple of other neat things as well. Anyways, once you have the sense of how many uh, or how much amperage you're actually going to need, the second thing you're going to need to know is how many power headers. And again, modular grid, same thing. You see a few few little ways over here. It'll tell you the quantity of modules, and the quantity of modules obviously is the quantity of headers. Now, one of the things I found is that a lot of modern power solutions will actually give you more amperage than they will headers. And so it's, it's important here to actually count out and to know exactly how many headers you are getting. Uh, I mentioned the other two considerations are power entry and type. The, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate online about this, and I'm not going to drone on about linear versus switching versus hybrid. All I will say is, by this point, most, most bus boards and most power solutions have some kind of noise filtering, and most of them will do a pretty good job. Unless you're really trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel with a super budget build, uh, for the most part, any, any modern power supply is probably going to be a good solution for you. Now, in, in this particular case that I have here, I decided to go with IntelliGel TPS30 Maxes. These each output, uh, I don't remember the specs. I want to say they output 1.5 amps at 12 volts, and they'll do up to 30 watts. I went with this, uh, this sort of uh, 4 HP um, mount for bringing in the power. I could have gone and built something custom, but kind of like I was saying, within the limits of time and skill, I just decided to keep it simple. And it's only 4 HP. I, I'll mention at the end, I have an idea about how to make better use of this space that I'll talk about. Anyways, here, even though IntelliGel uh, sells them, as sort of being like, here's here's one hybrid power supply. You can see that I've, I've got them both wired up together. Now, the thing that I had to do in order to make that work is IntelliGel sells two power bricks. They sell a 30 watt and an 80 watt power brick. And so because I'm running two and they each take 30 watts each, I'm using the 80 watt brick here on the outside. Another option, um, I'm actually, I kind of hinted at this earlier. I'm actually in the process of building another case. And another possibility when you build your case is to go with something like this. This is what is called a power distribution board. This does not supply the power and it doesn't take in power from a laptop brick, which is how the IntelliGel hybrid system works. Instead, this expects that you're going to run a linear or a switching power supply in your case. In other words, you're going to run mains into your case and you're going to have the mains go into a switching power supply and then the switching power supply output is going to go into these. Now, one of the advantages of going with a bus board, uh, well, I should say a disadvantage. A disadvantage is it requires a little bit more effort and planning and making sure that you know what you're doing. But the advantage is that you can really customize the quantity of headers that you have. So here in my case, you can see I've, I've got two of these, and the reason I have two is really to get up to the quantity of headers. There's, there's way more power in here than this case actually needs. But even still, you know, I, I tried to lay it out. You can see I've got it at an angle. I tried to lay it out so that I had was distributing the headers around the case as much as possible, but even still, I can't put a lot of small modules either on the far left or the far right. I have to concentrate small modules in the middle because that's where most of the headers are. And that's where using something like a bus board really comes in. Um, another downside to the bus board though is that you have to have, you have to plan for space in your case to allow that larger linear or switching power supply. Those, those typically tend to be a lot bigger and they take up more space. So again, this sort of goes hand in hand. You know, for, for this particular case, this was to be a portable case. So an external power entry with a laptop brick and then two hybrids just made a ton of sense because it doesn't take up a lot of space and it keeps things light. My next build is going to be more of a studio case. And so that's where I think these bus boards and more of a larger fixed switching power supply are going to work better. Depending on what you're building though, you kind of want to think through your options and pick the one that's going to make the most sense for you. All right, let's talk about something fun now. Let's talk about features. Features are one of the areas that you can just really make something yours. And the difference between buying a case and building a case can be the features that you you put in it to make it to make it fit whatever it is that you want to do. I'm going to show you a couple of the features that I've added to this case as well as some ideas about features that I'm either planning to add or thinking about for my next build. So the first I kind of had already mentioned, and that is the lid. Um, but there's one thing in particular I want to show you about it. 
You might have noticed earlier when I was talking about construction and dimensions and I'd put this up that I actually was able to take the lid completely off. These, these hinges here are a special kind of hinge called a removable hinge. And what it allows you to do is it works like a hinge, it'll hinge up and then you can just take it off. And so that, that just makes life easier. And for a, for a portable case, this means you can take this off and put this somewhere else. Um, somewhat funnily, I've actually been using, I've been flipping it over and I've been using the other side of this case as a shelf for, uh, I've got a poly end tracker and I've got a couple of guitar pedals and I set them up on here. And so even when I'm, even when I've got things set up, the, the lid actually kind of has a function to itself. In terms of laying this out, I, you notice that the hinges maybe somewhat unnaturally are up here at the top. And the reason that I did that is because now, whenever I'm playing, I don't have the hinge joint down here for me to, to catch my hand on or to catch a cable on or whatever. And so even though it's a little weird to put maybe the hinges up on top, I, I think that I liked that. And this is an example of one of those features you can customize when you build your own case. So in addition to the hinges, um, I, I put feet on it. So I have feet both on the bottom of the case so that I can set it down and I have feet on the back of the case. So if I'm setting my case on a, a little bit more of a delicate surface that I don't want to scratch up, then I have rubber feet that it will actually rest against. All of the hardware that I used, so the hinges and the handle and these rubber feet, I bought from a, a website called Reliable Hardware. I'll drop a link below to them. They're a little bit more spendy maybe than you would pay for hardware, but I think they have good quality stuff and they have exactly the kind of thing that you want if you're going to be building any kind of road case uh, hardware type of thing like that. All right, so another feature is uh, you can tell on the, the side view cam here, I'm, I'm actually sitting up, like the, the case is actually tilted up a little bit at me. And if you look on the top cam, you can see over here that I have a little screw that's protruding through. What these actually are is, let's see if I can do this without dropping everything. What these actually are is a little riser foot that comes out. That's not the most stable thing I've ever seen. Um, so you, you can see here the, the four main feet that I was talking about, but then I have these little things here. I picked these up on Amazon. Uh, I think that they just advertise them whoops, as adjustable feet. And you can see that that's all, all that they are. So I put one of these, I, I don't remember what this is called. I put one of these things in here. You can pick these up at Lowe's. And then the, the feet just have an adjustable height and the leg, uh, the foot part of it will actually move around. So if I want my case to be sitting up, I can put these in. And if I want it to be laying flat or if I'm um, transporting it and I don't want these sticking out to get broken off, then I can take them off. All right, I managed to put that back without dropping or breaking anything. That's not true, I may have knocked a guitar pedal off. Anyways, um, in this uh, last section, I want to talk about a couple of things. One is ideas that I've had since I built this, uh, things that I either may change on this case or might improve in, the, in other cases in the future. And then I want to share a little bit about the next case that I'm thinking about building. So uh, one of the features that I noticed after I got this is this particular power supply has these little white headers here. You can see it. You can see it on both, so here and here. Those are outputting 5 volts, which is the same amount that a USB uh, power jack would output. So one of the ideas that I had is it would be really nice if on this power entry panel right here, if maybe there were two USB jacks and I could, I could plug in like a, a, bendy, a bendy LED light if I was ever using my case in a dark setting or I could power my phone or what's really cool is hardware is now starting to support running off of that same signal. So for example, I mentioned I have a poly end tracker. The tracker can actually run off of a five volt signal. So again, I could actually power the tracker off of my Eurorack case if I had USB ports here that then routed over to these headers. So depending on the power solution that you're going with, that's something you might want to look at. If you have a five volt out you can potentially add USB power ports to the front of case, which I think could be really cool. Kind of along those lines, I think one of the one of the draws of 
having a your rack case and having everything mounted is that you can kind of keep keep things contained. And one of the ideas that that I've thought about, I I don't I don't think I'm going to do it on this case, but I'm going to potentially try on my next case is in addition to having power for your Euro rack modules, there are also pedal power supplies that you can pick up. And if you're like me and you like using guitar pedals with your Euro rack synthesizer, having a power pedal power supply integrated and then maybe having either a a for you panel where you have power ports or making some kind of side side entry either of those options will potentially allow you to simplify your setup so that you have both your your rack modules and a power supply for your pedals all in the same box lastly another idea that i had is all euro rack cases that i've seen typically get built like this where each three row basically butts right up against each other and so you can see in this case there's there's pretty much no room between the two of these. It's just modules right there. And you know, that makes sense. You don't want to have like super long patch distances. But one of the ideas that I had is what if what if there was space somewhere between half of an inch to an inch between each three U row? Could you could you make a little space there and maybe have a little bar on top of it so that you could put Velcro Velcro cable wraps? And that would give you space to have Velcro cable wraps that sort of held a lot of the patch cables between modules. Is that a way that you could use to sort of clean things up? I don't know. I don't know if I'm I'm going to risk that on my next one, but it, it was an idea that I had, which is can you add space between rows to somehow allow better cable management?